Hi, I'm Kate Hahn with TV Guide Magazine and TV Insider, and welcome to the third episode of The Buzz on Yellow Jackets, where we speak with the cast about the episode that we've just seen. And tonight we have Stephen Kruger, who plays Coach Ben Scott. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. This is fun. Yeah, it's a big, big episode for your character. We open on him looking completely dazed and confused after the uh, the dining, the cannibalism that went down in the episode before. When you first read the script, were you surprised that the coach didn't take part in the cannibalism or was that expected for you? It's a great question. I'm trying to remember. Um, I think I didn't quite know what to expect. We, we've talked a lot about the fact that uh, we knew that the cannibalism part was coming. That's obviously something that's been teased since the very beginning of, of the show. Um, and I think I remember wondering how it was going to play out. You know, like you have a vision in your head of like, oh, yes, at some point we are going to eat somebody. But the actual specific details and kind of the nitty gritty of how that was going to work, um, that was a mystery to me. And I, I envisioned it very differently. But once I actually read it and I had talked to our, our creators and our showrunners about, you know, Ben's overall arc for the season, it made perfect sense to me. And I thought, you know what, this is actually a really beautiful way to kind of launch into Ben's broader story for the rest of the season, because the whole point is he is now kind of ostracized from from the group. He has, you know, not necessarily through any fault of his own, but he has been pushed aside um, as that authority figure. And so now he's kind of left to his own devices. And a lot of times that ends up meaning, you know, his own psyche, um, which can be your own worst enemy at times. Well, yeah, we launched right into a flashback to him and his boyfriend, Paul. Um, did you have any input into what his backstory would be or what were your discussions and were you happy with his backstory? Yeah, I, I really was. I mean, I, I remember talking to uh, to our showrunners at the beginning of the season just about Ben's overall story arc. And and when they kind of got into this idea of we're going to see some some flashbacks um, into his you know life before he ever got on this plane, one of the things that I really wanted to hone in on was I want this to feel like uh, like a really authentic and necessary part of the story to kind of fill in a lot of the context and the gaps that we had from season one. Um, and I wanted it to be informative for the character and not, you know, I've talked before about, I think oftentimes in television, um, especially when you have a minority character, whether it be, you know, sexual orientation, ethnicity, a lot of times there are these kind of token side stories that they just throw in because it feels like an obligation. And so I didn't want it to feel like that. I wanted this to feel like something that was a necessary part of the story in order to kind of round out this character. And that's exactly what they ended up doing. Um, I, I really couldn't have been happier with the way that they started this storyline off. And then of course, as we get beyond uh, episode three, you start to see more and more of you know, what Ben is going through in his, in his own mind and how it kind of connects with the past that he left behind. Well, he has this uh, sequence towards the end of the episode that's a fantasy sequence where he thinks about what if I didn't get on the plane? Yeah. And he has this wonderful speech about, you know, I, I what if I weren't closeted? What if I weren't this closeted high school coach? What if I could actually be myself? How did you get ready to prepare to play a closeted gay man from the 90s when it was much, much harder to be out? That was a big, that was a big, big part of it. Um, I mean, really from the beginning, I, you know, I knew uh, from the pilot going forward, even there, there was a, a previous iteration of the pilot episode that actually revealed Ben's sexuality in the very first episode of the series. Um, and that was initially the way I thought this was going to play out. And um, because of a number of different reasons, they shifted it to, you know, making that reveal later in the first season, which I actually kind of loved. Um, you know, you, think you get to know this guy and then all of a sudden you know you drop this bomb and then it's fun to go back and kind of pick out the little easter eggs that were left behind about oh you know what that actually makes sense like there was this little thing and this little thing um and so i honestly think that going into season two i wanted to just do the story justice i guess is the is the simplest way to put it i mean it's a, it's a heavy load to lift and like i said i think that it's important that every character kind of gets a little piece of what they were like before. Um, so I didn't have a ton of, of input into it other than to say, you know, I think we're going in the right direction here. Um, and I, our writers are so damn good at what they do that truthfully, there isn't really anything that I would have changed. You know, we had discussions uh, before every episode that we shot with flashbacks um, to make sure that we were kind of finding one common through line. But outside of that, they were so on it and they have such a clear vision in their heads of what they want this to be. And, and I was on board from the from the very beginning. Did you have to do any research to get into that headspace or what? Oh my God. You... Yes. Yes. That was, that was really important. So, so, I mean, you touched on it, the idea of, you know, 
being a gay person now is so different than it was, especially a gay male. Um, so you were dealing with a couple of different things, right? You were dealing with the the backside of the AIDS epidemic. Um, and of course, we're, you know, in and out of New York City, which is almost ground zero for that. So and, and of course, I was too young to really understand all the all the inner workings of, of that. Um, so I did. I did a ton of research. I also one of the things that was really important to me that stuck out was not only am I a closeted gay man, I also am a teacher um, who is working with children. Um, and what did that mean in that time period? You know, why was this such a closely guarded secret? Why is it something that I took such great lengths to protect? Um, and the reason for that is my life and my career essentially would have been over if this was if this was ever revealed. You know, um, the the laws in New Jersey around that time they didn't pass a law until until much later that would have protected me um, as as a gay teacher. So I easily would have been fired um, and and potentially even you know prosecuted for for having an impact on minors. And that was something that kind of weighed really heavily on me. It was something that I really wanted to make sure I incorporated just kind of like in the internal workings of of every scene that I did. Well, wow, that's really interesting. I didn't know that that he would have been in such jeopardy during that time period. Yeah, yeah, it's, and, it, and it's truly it's why the reveal at the end of you know towards the end of of season one that the the scene that that he has with uh, with Natalie where she kind of you know she knows and and she is so brazen about the fact that she knows and just kind of like lets it spill out. And I remember filming that scene and thinking like. You, you can't just say like, what are you doing? You cannot just say that out loud. I don't care if it's just the two of us. You Like the fact that you're acting so brazenly about this just reminds me that you are a child and you don't actually really understand, you know, all of the different complexities that, that go into this. And this thing that I've been keeping a secret and guarding so closely for so many years. Well, you mentioned her being a child and he is still, as you also said, really the only adult in, in this strange little civilization in the wilderness. Yeah. And when we see one of his flashbacks with Paul, you know, we we learn that he has described these these girls as vicious in the past, but he also has expressed a need to be there for them and take care of them. So is this an episode that we've just seen where he's really kind of grappling with those two aspects of his relationship to the team? Yeah, you you honestly nailed it. I think that that the beginning of this season is for for Ben is really about him trying to juggle those two things it's finding that balance between um you know he feels this innate sense of responsibility for these young people um he's the only adult that's left after the crash um and this is his position this is the identity that he's created for himself he's a coach he's a, a teacher he's a mentor um and so yes he obviously feels this this instinctual obligation to help them to protect them um at the same time he's dealing with the fact that they don't really care anymore you know, like they don't really see him as that anymore, even though that's still how he views himself. Um, and so to wrestle with those two two conflicting ideas is really kind of what launches his story for the rest of the season. And we start to see the beginning of that in, in episode three. Um, and the sad part about this is that the identity he's created for himself over the years as, you know, this coach, as this protector, um, once that's stripped away, what does he have left? And, and that's something that I really started to grapple with with this episode was, okay, cool, that's gone. Where do I go from here? You know, I've lived my entire life uh, putting on a mask, you know, putting on a persona, putting on an act for everybody around me. And now that that's been stripped away, it just leaves this kind of raw mess of a person who doesn't really know who he is, who doesn't really know what his place in this world is. Um, and, and that ends up having some pretty dire consequences. Well, he has the one scene where he hallucinates that one of the girls uh, is still a little hungry and might want to chow down on him next. So uh, what was that scene like to shoot? I, I you know, do, are you there with the actress who has, you know, all the, you know, prosthetics foaming at the mouth? Talk about shooting that scene. Yeah, I, I'm so glad that you hit on that. So so uh, there's a couple things about that scene. Number one is that scene wasn't originally in there. Um, that was that it was it was a slightly different version of that scene that didn't have the the kind of animal you know attack hallucination type vibe to it. Um, and funnily enough, I I had kind of created on my own 
um, for that ending moment of episode two, you know, when all of the girls are are kind of attacking Jackie's corpse and, and I'm the only one that withholds, um, I had kind of created for myself, you know what, Ben has probably had this, this nightmare himself, that he is the one that is being feasted on by all of these girls. And so whatever I was working with at the end of, of episode two, they saw something going on on my face, you know, and whatever I was doing. And then all of a sudden we get the rewrite for episode three and they had added in this piece about, you know, a girl kind of turning into an animal and and wanting to attack me. And I thought that is, it's one of the first times that's ever happened in my career where like I'm doing something just kind of privately as an actor and whatever it is that I'm doing is translating on screen to the point where they actually change one of the, the storylines going forward. So that scene kind of came out of out of that. It was born out of you know what we shot at the end of episode two, um, and then to actually film that scene was was incredible. Uh, the, our, our DP and our camera uh, team did an amazing job of using different filters. Um, so they would put different filters on the camera, and there were takes in which um, we replaced the actress. So so it was uh, uh, Maya Lowe, and she did a phenomenal job of even when she was off camera really getting into her body as an animal. And like I mean, I didn't have to do a whole lot of acting honestly. It was it was pretty scary. And then we would also do takes where our cameraman actually acted as as her and he just kind of replaced her on set. And so he would get down and kind of crouch in that position and kind of lunge at me with the camera. And so it was a lot of just playing off of him um, directly into the into the lens of the camera. And then, of course, you know, special effects and makeup did all kinds of crazy stuff with the foaming at the mouth and, and all of that. And I, I think it pieced together really well. I still haven't watched it. Um, but from what I understand, it's, it's actually come together really well. And it's like, it's kind of an interesting standout scene. How vulnerable do you feel, uh, you know, your, your character has had one of his legs amputated. So when you have to get around set, how vulnerable do you feel? How hard is it for you? I don't quite know how they make that work. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, well, for starters, it's something that I, it's another, it was another point of research for me. Um, and, and part of what appealed so much about this character from the beginning is there are so many things to play with that were so foreign to me. Um, being a closeted gay man in the 90s, uh, being the victim of a, of a traumatic injury like that, a, you know, a limb being amputated. These are all things that I spent a lot of time kind of researching and learning about um, going into filming season one and that I continued to, to work on as we went through that first season. So um, just practically to kind of reveal some behind the scenes stuff, the way that they do it is um, it's, it's, all, it's all basically virtual effects. Um, so I wear a, a, a long blue sock over my leg and um, you know, there's a practical element to this as well. When you're getting ready to shoot a scene, we always consult with the director and the visual effects supervisor to say, okay, you know, how is your leg going to be positioned so that it, it makes it the easiest to kind of remove this um, once we get into post, you know, in the in the editing process. And so that's always a that's always a, a discussion, you know, how can we make this easiest on you? But also as an actor, you know, if all of a sudden all I'm thinking about is my leg because it's in some weird position that I'm trying to hide it that's, you know, that's the only thing that's going to be in my head. So, um, you know, there's a little bit of push and pull about you know, how can we make this easy on the post team? How can we make it easy on, on me as the actor? Um, and then, yeah, to answer your question about getting around the set, um, it is a challenge, you know, like, and I think that that really feeds into a lot of what I'm, what I'm doing with the character. It never, it honestly never gets any easier. Like, you know, we're on these practical sets where they built this cabin and there's, you know, little imperfections in the wood on the floor, there's things that are slippery. And so I really am, you know, again, it's it's not a whole lot of acting on my part. I'm being really careful as I kind of walk around on these crutches. Um, and I, I think it just adds like an extra layer of, of you know, shock value to, to what Ben is going through. Well, Ben also spends a lot of time in this episode lying in that bed in the cabin. Hmm. Uh, you, how comfortable is that? Not very, not very, it's not. You know, we didn't go and get this mattress from uh, from Casper or anything like that. It's uh, it's like a very it was a very thin layer of something uh, that was basically like a cot. Um, and, you know, again, I think with the leg, you're figuring out ways to kind of hide it as you go. So it's like, can we put the leg under a blanket for this take um, so that we don't necessarily see it? And the other thing about it, though, is like, I don't think that Ben very often is comfortable, you know, so there's something about this that that feeds into 
the way I'm able to portray the character because really truly Ben doesn't find himself in a whole lot of comfortable situations, either physically or or psychologically. So I like that, you know, I'm in these situations on set where I'm feeling a little bit uncomfortable and not quite in my body, because I think that's that's really what Ben is going through. Did you shoot the flashback scenes first and then the cabin scenes or vice versa? Because I'm wondering when you're doing the cabin scenes and having these flashback moments, did you have something to draw on after having already shot those flashbacks or was it the other way around? It was different for every episode. Um, so, you know, spoiler alert, this isn't the first flashback, this isn't the last flashback that we'll see uh, of the season. So it kind of just depended on the schedule for that particular episode. Um, we did run into, you know, again, some, some practical issues about uh, the beard that I have, um, you know, throughout the season and, and, and having to go back and shave the beard and then get a beard back and, and all of that kind of stuff. So it was a little bit of back and forth. Um, but no, episode by episode, we, we kind of went in and out of the flashbacks, which was, which was actually a really nice way to shoot it just because you were able to kind of have some of that context of, of what I had been going through in the flashbacks when we were in the cabin. Um, but yeah, everything kind of integrated seamlessly. I, I often wondered if it would have been easier to, say like save all of the flashback scenes for the very end of the season and shoot them just kind of all in succession but um i like the way that it played out i think that i think that it was necessary to kind of do them in real time as we were filming the rest because um i was able to match what i was doing in the flashbacks to what was happening in the cabin and kind of create like a really a really fun through line between the two well you mentioned these practical sets and the world that is created in this show is so believable and so real and so creepy and in this episode we have the creepiest baby shower that we've ever seen uh can you, can you talk about i mean do you, do you walk onto set and say okay let me see the weird props that we have today you know talk about that baby shower maybe in relation to ben he can kind of hear it from the other room right like what's he going through there's a lot I mean there's there's a lot that he can hear from the other room I mean he you know he is in this room kind of trying to get away from all of that but look it's a, it's a small cabin you know there there's no way that you can completely cut yourself off and I certainly can't go outside because it's winter time um and so yeah I think there's this really interesting push and pull between I'm in I've, I've tried to escape the mayhem that's going on out there but it's inescapable you know, there really is nothing that I can do to get away from these girls, to get away from the chaos that's happening out there. And it just adds an extra layer of, I don't know, just things to struggle through. You know, he's laying there and he would like to really just put a pillow over his head and not think about any of this. But good luck with that. You know, it's 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 not going to happen. And it just kind of seeps into every action I take, every word that I say, um, which I love. Again, like nothing about this should feel comfortable. You know what I mean? Is there one of the girls who's really his ally going forward? I mean, you mentioned Natalie can really see him more clearly than anyone else. Yeah, yeah. I think they, funnily enough, I think they did a great job of kind of setting up that friendship. And we and we see it, you know, starting to form at the end of season one in those last few episodes. And then we also see it in these in these first few episodes of, uh, of season two. Um, without giving away too much, I, I think what we end up seeing, though, is yeah, he feels like there are some points of commonality with Natalie where maybe she understands him in a different way than everybody else does. But at the end of the day, Ben is still on an island. He really is still on an island. And I think he spends a lot of this season starting to come to the realization that he cannot really trust any of these girls as much as he would like to, as much as he would be able, would like to have a relationship with one of them, um, just to have somebody there that he can rely on it's just not in the cards for him. And and again, a lot of his story is seeing him come to that realization and also grapple with what that means. And what about Travis? Travis is the one who comes in and checks on him and says, you're not looking so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I, I think that there, you know, the fact that there is uh, another man there is is probably somewhat comforting. But I think that, that Coach Ben also sees Travis as as closer to the women because A, He's in a relationship with one of them, right? He's he's in a relationship with Natalie and he's still a teenager himself. You know, it's not like he's a colleague or a peer um, or somebody that he can really connect with. In a way, it's actually probably more difficult for him to connect with uh, with young Travis because he does know, again, not that there is any sort of, you know, sexual attraction to, to Travis at all, but that just the fact in the back of his mind, he knows, hey, if it ever came out, you know, about my sexuality, and I had some sort of close friendship with this with this young male, there's going to be questions about that. 
Um, and, and one of the things that I've talked about in, in a lot of interviews that I, I think kind of plays in the back of my mind constantly is as Ben, I'm always flashing forward to the what if of if we are rescued, who are the questions going to go to, you know, who's going to be grilled about what happened out there, about why it all happened. And that's going to be the one adult that came out of this. So I think Ben is also really wrestling with that idea constantly of I'm, I'm still responsible in a way. I still have to make sure I'm able to answer these questions in a satisfying way if we're ever, you know, fortunate enough to be asked them. Right. And he must be terrified. How will I defend the fact that I didn't stop them from eating their teammate? Yep, exactly. Along with a myriad of other questions. Why did you not do this? Why did you not do that? And to to simply say, well, they didn't let me or they pushed me out. That may stand in the world that we're living in and the, the world that the audience is seeing. But think about it from my perspective. That's not going to fly back in the real world. You know, it's still you should have done something. You were the grown up. You were the adult in the room. Why didn't you do something? And that's trust me a, a, as an actor. That's something that I always have in the back of my mind just for the character himself that I think adds just like a little bit of texture to what he's going through. Well, you see it when Natalie goes to take Jackie's bones back to the plane and he's sitting by the window and he says, hey, well, that, you know, we can say that she died in the crash. You know, if you bury her bones with everyone else, he's already planning on what to say about it. Yeah. I mean, he has to, right? This is, this is, this is survival technique. I mean, you, you, you have to find a way to be useful in a situation like this. And if they are not going to listen to me when I give advice, um, okay, then I'm going to say things out loud and hopefully you take it, you know, at least I've, at least I've still said it, at least I've still expressed my opinion, um, take it or leave it. And, and we know at this point that most likely they're going to leave it. Um, in that particular case that you mentioned, you know, I was very happy to see that they said, okay, you know what, maybe he's actually right this time, which was, that was a, a welcome relief. Well, we're glad you're still around in the 90s because you're one of the people we don't see in the present day. So that's always a little concerning for us when there's a character we like as much as we like yours. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you what, it's a little concerning for me as well. Um, I will admit, I have no idea. Um, we, we really, I, I know that Oftentimes the audience probably thinks that like we know everything that's going to happen, but believe me, as far as the cast goes, beyond the season that we're in, we really have no idea. Um, we we don't know what's going on. We don't know who's going to be revealed to to be alive in the present day. Uh, so all I can say is is pray, pray for Coach. Okay, we will be praying for Coach. <laughs> well, Stephen Kruger, thank you so much for speaking with me about episode three of Yellow Jackets. It was a lot of fun, fascinating stuff. Yeah, good. I'm glad. Uh, and I hope that everybody uh, en enjoys it. We put a lot of work into this one. Thank you. Thank you so much.